It is the 4th of January 1986 and 26-year-old James Harrison is working at the Sequoia Fuels Corporation site in a scrubber building. He begins coughing. Little does he know that he has inhaled a deadly cocktail of hydrofluoric acid. An alarm is heard and he escapes the building, but the chemicals he had ingested will prove to be fatal. The building he was working in was 15 metres away from a ruptured tank which held uranium hexafluoride, a compound used in the enrichment of uranium for the nuclear industry. The event would release 29,500 pounds of material into the atmosphere and would expose and hospitalise many workers. It would not be the first time that operator Kerr McGee would be entangled in a nuclear controversy with the Karen Silkwood scandal in the late 1970s and it would not be the last. As like many similar events, the release would be the result of improper management, multiple shift changeovers and product handling issues. Sadly, the working class employees would pay the price. As such, I'm going to rate this disaster here 5 on my disaster scale but only three on my legacy scale due to the event being quickly forgotten because of another bigger disaster in 1986. The road to 1986 started back in 1968 with Kerr McGee breaking ground on a new uranium processing plant. The site is near the town of Gore Vian and Weber Falls in eastern Oklahoma, not far from Interstate 40. The site was intended to be used to convert yellow cake into gaseous uranium hexafluoride and was licensed as a fuel cycle facility regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission operated under Kerr McGee Nuclear Corporation. Production started on site in April 1970 with a conversion capacity of 4,550 metric tonnes of uranium per year, working 24 hours a day with a four-shift pattern. This subsidiary split into two companies in the early 1980s, in which one of them, Sequoia Fuels Corporation, would be responsible for owning and operating the site. The process in its most basic explanation is yellow cake in, uranium hexafluoride out. But we will want to have a look in a little more detail. Uranium concentrate is weighed, sampled and then digested using nitric acid to produce uranyl nitrate, which then undergoes a solvent extraction process where impurities are removed from the product. The impure uranyl nitrate solution enters at one end of the solvent extraction circuit, while a mixture of organic solvents that have the ability to absorb uranium enters at the other. Passing in counter currents past each other, the two solutions enter six stages of mixing and setting, where the uranium is extracted from the solution and the impurities remain in the acid. The barren acid solution is neutralized and is further processed to remove radioactive uranium daughter products, such as radium, which are then stored on site as a sludge. The processed raffinate which is virtually free of radioactivity, is then stored on site in holding ponds to be reduced by evaporation. The solvent extraction solution containing the purified uranium is re-extracted into water in a counter-current pulse column and enters an evaporation and boil down process. Evaporation concentrates the weak uranyl nitrate solution into molten uranyl nitrate hexahydrate, or UNH. This intermediate form of uranium is then converted by thermal decomposition to uranium trioxide in a denitration process. Furnaces heat the denitrator troughs which are equipped with agitator arms that constantly stir the UNH. The UO3 drawn from the denitrator troughs is shaped into orange colored pellets measuring about a millimeter in diameter. Grinding pulverizes these pellets into a fine powder. The powder is reacted with hydrogen in a two-stage counterflow fluid bed reactor to produce UO2 as a powder. This powder is then put into a two-stage stir bed reactor, also with a counter-current flow. Hydrogen fluoride is added 
and the UO2 is converted into uranium tetrafluoride. The uranium tetrafluoride is then transferred to a tower reactor where reaction with elemental fluoride creates the final product. To solidify the UF6, it is sent to coal traps. It is then heated again to turn into a liquid for pumping into storage tanks. Once inside, the UF6 solidifies as it cools down to room temperature. These tanks are rolled around on carts running on tracks. The cart and tank before filling are rolled onto a set of scales. It will be kept here throughout the filling process to measure the net weight. Stopping of the filling of the cylinders on site is done manually by operators and there is no automatic cutoff. During filling via a flexible pigtail line, UF6 is kept at a temperature of around 210 degrees Fahrenheit. It can take several eight hour shifts to fully fill a tank and all of this is dependent on the production rate on site. After filling, the tank's valve is closed and the hose is removed and the product is moved via forklift to a steam chest, which is used to keep the UF6 in liquid form. Cylinder number E2047, a model 48Y tank, passed a 20 point inspection in October 1985. This was intended to find any damage to the valve or welds on the unit and is conducted by an experienced and licensed engineer. The cylinder is made up of 5 eighths of an inch thick steel. The body is approximately 117 inches long with an inside diameter of 48 inches. In total, the empty weight of such a container is 5,200 pounds and is not allowed to exceed a net weight of 27,500 pounds. The same inspection is undertaken by a shift manager before any filling takes place, which is exactly what happened on the 3rd of January 1986 at 10 a.m. Filling would initially take place at two different traps, providing 1,230 and 10,000 pounds of UF6 during the morning shift. During the evening shift, a further £12,200 are added, bringing up the net weight to £23,430. Next came the midnight shift. As part of the handover, the operator was informed that he would be continuing to fill the tank. The operator is to fill the tank to the target weight of £27,500. But he notices something strange when the scales won't go above. £26,400. After investigation, the operator notices that one of the cylinder's cartwheels aren't completely on the scales. This is a problem as the weight is not being properly measured. After several attempts to move the cart, eventually he manages to get a new reading on the scales, which can only show a maximum of £30,000. The operator is shocked to find that it is reading £29,500, in effect bottoming out. Worried, the operator consults his supervisor, who suggests using vacuum from the previously emptied coal traps to remove the excess weight. The evacuation begins at 6.15am and initially around £150 are removed in a space of 10 minutes. At the end of his shift, he reports to the relieving operator of the overfill due to the cart being off the scales. As the day shift went on, the operator who ironically was the one who initiated the filling the day before, noted that no more product was being evacuated. As we saw before, once the UF6 reaches room temperature, it begins to solidify. The assistant supervisor and the operator then decided to move the tank into a steam chest. The placing of an overfilled tank into a steam chest is a direct violation of company policy. At around 11.30 a.m., the tank ruptured after 2 hours and 15 minutes of heating. The force of the explosion damaged the top of the steam chest. The UF6 vaporized and combined with moisture in the steam chest released a highly acidic gas. This deadly chemical made its way into the facility ventilation system. It was here that James Harrison inhaled the acidic gas. The plume left the plant had traveled 29 kilometers due to a strong wind heading south past the I-40 and over several sparsely populated residential areas. The vapour entered the ventilation intake vents of the process building, injuring the employees within. Most of the approximately 40 workers on site at the time were in the lunchroom. Upon realising the danger, many escaped but had to pass through the cloud. The evacuation alarm was sent and the ventilation system was switched off. 
The rendezvous point for the site workers was luckily upwind, where they observed the release for a further 40 minutes. The company didn't really have an emergency plan, but the Gore Police Department was called and they notified the Sequoia County Sheriff's Department and Oklahoma Highway Patrol to close down the I-40 and Highway 10. Harrison was driven 13 kilometres to a nursing home for a canister of oxygen before he was taken to Sequoia Memorial Hospital. However, upon reaching the hospital, it was discovered that he was ill-equipped for treating Harrison and sent him to the larger Sparks Regional Medical Centre in Fort Smith, Arkansas, another 34 kilometres away. He would die at 3pm soon after arriving at the emergency room. The fatality was a result of the company not having an adequate emergency plan arrangement with local hospitals. In total, 100 people were sent to hospital with 21 severely injured. Most of the contamination was within the boundary site. In total, around three curries of radiation was released. In comparison, Three Mile Island released over four times that at 13 curries. During the investigation, it was found that the cylinder was not defective, but instead succumbed to the extreme pressure caused by an overfilled container being heated and the UF-6 expanding past the point of no return. The site after cleanup would continue to operate until 1993, but it would see another release in 1992. This, coupled with storage ponds leaking into the ground, meant that the site would need a long time to be fully decommissioned and cleaned. The incident didn't stir much in the media, as you would have thought. But luckily for Care McGee, that just a few months later, Chernobyl would happen. This video is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in the sunny southeastern corner of London, UK. Help the channel grow by liking, commenting and subscribing. Check out my Twitter for all sorts of photos and odds and sods, as well as hints on future videos. I've got Patreon and YouTube membership as well, so if you fancy, check them out to support the channel financially. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.